As nurses, leaders, and thoughtful human beings, how can we cultivate resilience during times of crisis and existential threat? Let's talk all about it with Chris Racinos of the Nurse Leader Network, right here on episode 317 of The Nurse Keith Show. Hey there, this is Nurse Keith. In these days of the COVID-19 pandemic, I'm still bringing you my pandemic updates at the end of every month. Meanwhile, this podcast continues to be all about you, your personal and professional development, your nursing and healthcare career, and healthcare system as a whole. And I'm here to share education, ideas, diatribes, and informative interviews with some of the most inspiring people from the worlds of healthcare, nursing, medicine, tech, entrepreneurship, and beyond. I love having you along for the ride, whether you're new to the show or you've been on this journey with me for months or years. Always, always, I feel grateful for you being part of the growing Nurse Keith Nation. And remember, Nurse Keith Coaching is your destination for all things related to your career. I offer individualized, holistic career coaching for nurses and healthcare professionals around the world. And if you email me at keith at nursekeith.com, we'll set up a complimentary consult and you get 10% off your first coaching package if you mention the show. I'll give you even a little more off if you mention the name Chris Racinos. So just remind me. The show notes for this episode will be at nursekeith.com forward slash the word episode and the number 317. Oh my gosh, I can't believe it. We are here with friend of the pod, Chris Racinos of the Nurse Leaders Network at nurseleadersnetwork.com. And Chris, you're so awesome. And we've already had some great conversations before this. And I wanted to ask you this first question. So uh, how are you cultivating resilience as a person living through this existentially challenging time? Well, it's it hasn't been easy. Um, and I'm mm -hmm. assuming that there's, um, everybody who's listening to this podcast can kind of attest to how difficult it has been. Um, I, I want to kind of take you back through, uh, some of my personal history that'll give you an idea of how I got to where I am now. Go for it. So I grew up here in Los Angeles in foster care. Um, I grew up, I was the oldest of seven and, um, we all were split into different ways and had to, uh, learn really quickly how to kind of fend for ourselves because foster care back in the nineties was not, um, very kind to children. And I ended up, um, at 14 years old being pregnant. I was a pregnant mom, teen mom at 14 and, um, didn't really have a choice around resiliency, right? It was either you get it together at 14 and take care of your child, or you'll lose your child to foster care too. And I didn't want my daughter to experience what I had experienced. And so I think mm -hmm. the first, um, the first mechanisms that I had in terms of resilience was actually a, a uh, maladaptive uh, way. And that was really avoidance. I really avoided, um, a lot of, uh, the feelings that I had, I really avoided um, understanding, you know, the anger, the sadness, all of that kind of thing, and, and really turned on my switch of numbness. And so I think that is mm. something that um, you'll commonly find people when they really don't know what to do. They don't know how to um, move forward with their emotions, or they've been told as children that, you know, especially maybe boys, um, you know, don't show your sadness, don't show whatever it is. Um, and so I think a lot of people hold it in. Sure. Um, and so I think that, you know, was my first kind of pass at resiliency, really. It just got me through what I wanted, needed to get through. And although it was maladaptive, it really did get me through what I, where I needed to get through. Um, I'm going to fast forward into my career. So I, you know, ended up graduating with my bachelor's and my master's and, um, you know, uh, just began climbing up the career ladder. I uh, was a registered nurse and ended up went going to nurse practitioner school. Um, and then from there, really um, decided I, I needed to go back and get a PhD um, and kind of fell into leadership. You fell into leadership. Okay. Yeah, it's a kind of funny story, but that's off topic. But I ended up... I uh, off topic's great, yeah, I, really. I, um, you know, I was a nurse practitioner at a, a family, a federally qualified healthcare center. And we lost our medical director, nursing director, CEO, and CFO within the span of a couple of months. Um, what was in the water there? I mean, you no, know, it was something fishy. Uh, so okay. that, that's what I'll say. But it was something really fishy. And at that point, because I um, was, uh, you know, an FNP, and I had only been there 
literally like not even a couple of months. Um, but because as an FMP, the board, you know, um, put in an interim CEO and the interim CEO asked me if I could step in and, and, um, become the nursing director. And I was like, yeah, I don't know anything about nursing directing, but I will do what I can do to keep this clinic going. Cause of, you know, I wanted my patients to be able to see people. And, right. um, Right. It was funny because we, I found out that Friday that we were about to lose our FTCA status, which FTCA is a status where um, it, it legally protects you in terms of um, lawsuits. And there's a lot of different things that uh, the FTCA does, but it's a status that you don't want to lose as a free clinic or a non for profit clinic. And uh, we were going to lose ours because we didn't have a quality program in place. And so I, that weekend, you know, reviewed everything that I could, wrote this policy, grabbed, you know, whoever I could from the clinic that made sense to create this committee. We had our meeting minutes and I submitted that on a Monday and said, we are back on track. And they let us, they deemed us with our FTCA, meaning we got the status. Wow, Chris, that's, that's resilient. And that's a, that's such an ability to pivot and just sort of like make it happen. So where we we went back to your childhood and foster care, and then you pulled yourself out of that, and you actually became a nurse, got your bachelor's, got your master's. Now you have your, you've had your PhD a while now, and then you became. Is this the the gig where you became CNO of Kaiser? No, so this is actually the gig where I became uh, one of the first medical directors in California. So most medical directors, wow. and in that role, I ended up getting promoted to the, the interim chief uh, medical officer position there. And so that kind of led me to uh, becoming uh, the deputy nurse executive at the Veterans Administration out here. And then um, I ended up going to Kaiser for a variety of reasons and ended up uh, the chief nurse executive at Kaiser here um, in Southern California. So that was- And I spoiled the whole thing by saying it first. Yeah, Sorry it, about it that. It was totally, it was a trajectory and it wasn't, it was not something I'm telling you I was planning. I thought administration was the devil. I wanted to see patients. That's why I became an FMP instead of, you know, going the admin route. And uh, I just kept kind of climbing because I kept giving my best. Um, you know, every every time that I could advocate for a patient, when I had to stand up against, and, you know, for those of you who are leaders or even, you know, frontline, you know that there's times you have to stand up against unethical situations and it's hard. It's hard to like look at your boss or whoever and say, I'm not doing that because it's not right. But I kept doing that. And, um, and I realized that what had served me as a child, which was continuing to go through the motions, wasn't mm-hmm. serving me well as an adult. So I, I became this nurse executive, was loving my job. And um, I ended up waking up one day. And, uh, you know, at this time, my daughter, who I had had at 14, she was 19. She was a UCLA student and a doctor. Mm-hmm. And I went to go knock on her door to wake her up because usually she had been, you know, she had woken up her way earlier than I did and was on her way out. And yeah, there was a note that was on the floor and the note said, um, don't let the kids see. I love you. Harmony. Her name was Harmony. And, uh, I opened the door and I found my daughter lifeless in her bed. Um, uh, oh. had taken her life. Um, just died. Oh. and so I, you know, I, I tried CPR. I did everything I could, but unfortunately I couldn't save her. And I realized that oh, time, I'm so sorry, Chris. Thank you so much. Um, but I realized at that time um, that I really needed to take a good look at where I was going because I had put all of my intention into always serving the patients, always serving the organizations, always serving everybody that I could. Mm. Um, and, by, and by doing that, I um, had really created a gap in my own well being and in the well being of my children. Um, yes. Yeah. And so I think that's where I discovered the paradigm around, um, you know, the different levels of resilience and how to really cultivate it within yourself. And that's kind of where I'm at today. Now I, um, you know, have moved on from Kaiser, started my own business and am really working with um, nursing leaders to be able to de- not only develop their careers, but also develop um, healthy habits so that they remain resilient. Healthy habits. I mean, that couldn't be more important anytime. And you and I are recording this at the very, very end of January, 2021. This episode's coming out a few months after, but talk about resilience need in, in leadership. I mean, of course, we've been talking about compassion fatigue and burnout and moral injury in nurses, the nurses who were out there slogging away in the ICU and the ER and the 
the COVID units and everywhere, actually, clinics, you know, you name it, people are slogging away and this existential threat hanging over us, right? So, but we don't even need an existential threat like the COVID pandemic to to push us to our edge, actually. And I think most nurses out there will probably nod in agreement to that, right? And you are too. So, cultivating habits in nurse leaders. And I know you have a website called the Nurse Leader Network and you have a podcast that just launched in early 2020, yep. right? Mm-hmm. And um, and you also are building a membership site for nurse leaders. Like I'm building a membership site for nurses, not not specifically leaders. So tell us about what is it about nurse leadership that you want to really hone in on. You mentioned habits, so that's a good one. But what else do you want to do you want to make sure nurse leaders internalize and really kind of own in their careers? Where are you headed with this? So what I would say, and this is just a huge gap that I see, not just in nurse leaders, but just in nurses mm-hmm. in general, is that mm-hmm. we fail to identify our why. We think our why is because we want to help people, right? I mean, that's why most of us go into nursing. Right. Um, but I think we we really fail to um, get really clear on what our why is. And there's a really great book out there um, called Start With Why by Simon Sinek. And then he has a follow-up called mm-hmm. Find My Why. Um, and so um, right around that time that I lost my daughter, I actually um, ran into that book. I don't remember how I found out about it, but I did the Find My Why. And I realized um, my why, I was not living my why. So I had become this nurse leader, um, was running, you know, um, a, a $60 million budget with like, tons of nurses and loved wow. it, but my my why was not being fulfilled and it was leading to um, anxiety. It was leading to stress. It was leading to depression. Um, and so I think in terms of um, the folks that are listening, the first thing you want to do is really find your why. And there's a little activity that I have uh, folks do to help them get started. So you can definitely check out that book. I highly recommend it. But um, what I'd like you to do is kind of take you through this. And I'm going to, I'll actually take you through it, uh, Keith, so that you can. Okay. Like. I'm game. I'm game. Go for I it. I want you to, um, first of all, uh, you're going to kind of pull out either whatever it is you want to write on. So you'd take either a piece of paper or a, you know, if you're an iPad person, what your iPad or whatever. And I want you to have a piece of paper right here. Perfect. And then you're going to divide it into four sections. So you're going to have like, you know, the top section will have two and then the bottom section will have two. And then you'll have like your four square kind of thing. So kind of like that. I'm showing you on Zoom. That is perfect. Okay. I feel like I'm like Stephen Colbert and some guest is leading me through, (laughs) through a game or something. And it, well, what you're going to win at the end of this game is something that's really going to define where your life goes. And so it's, this is a really good game. Uh, this is the first time I've been coached on my show. This is great. Yay. There's a first time for everything. So, mm-hmm. so I want you to tell me where is, where's your favorite place in the whole world? Where's your favorite place? Ooh, my favorite place in the whole world. Um, boy. That's a really hard one. Okay. Well, one of your um, what is one of the top? One of my favorite places. I would say Iceland. Okay. So I, I want you to pretend that you are in Iceland and that- In the summer. In the summer, I yes, because it's way too cold in the winter. And mm-hmm. that you run into a friend either from high school or college or whatever, but just a friend that you haven't seen in a long time. And that mm-hmm. friend goes up to you and is like, oh my gosh, Keith, how are you? I haven't seen you in forever. It's been ages. Tell me about what you're up to. And I want you to imagine that you um, are five years from now and you are living like the best life you could possibly live. So if, if, if you could not fail, if you could do anything, have anything, what would that look like? And so you take, you know, a minute or so to define what that looks like. And I'll give you an example. For me, it was uh, when I wrote mine down, it was, um, you know, being able to go to PTA meetings and doctor's appointments because I was missing those. It was being a healthy weight and enjoying time with my family. It was, um, you know, in terms of money, like having no student loans and spending $50,000 a year on, I mean, uh, um, uh, a month on um, the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention now that I'm doing a lot of work with them. So it was just those things would make like, that's my perfect life. If I could be living it, that's how I would find it. And so I want you to start writing down those things that would make your life what you think would be just be so meaningful. And so you want to think about meaningful and joy same time. And 
as you're writing them down, you're going to pull out four themes. Um, for me, my themes were um, one, my family, one was my health, one was finance, and then one was community service. I really um, thrive on community service. So go ahead and take a minute or, or, you know, a couple seconds or so, write it down and try to pull out four themes that you have there. Okay. Talk amongst yourselves while I'm doing this. Um, yes, I want the listeners to sit and think about it. Like, Oh, good. Okay. Like? Does your best life include, you know, having 50 cats? That's what my daughter's best life would be. Um, Ooh, I don't think George would like that. Um, <laughs> he's a real loner. Yeah. I don't think he'd like, he doesn't even like when a neighborhood cat comes by and looks in the window. Um, yeah. He's, he's, uh, <laughs> he likes his space. Yeah. Yeah. So. Okay. I think I've got it. I think I've got you it. I think you have your four themes. Yeah, I think so. Okay. So yeah. now on the opposite side of that paper, I want you to write down like a quick you know, to-do list, um, a personal to-do list and a professional to-do list. So maybe, you know, for the listeners, your professional to-do list has things like check emails and um, respond to so-and-so and, you know, you have a commitment. Mm -hmm. And then maybe some personal things are like, you know, got to do the, get the groceries or mow the lawn or whatever, you know, see my friends or whatever you have on your personal and professional. Okay. So you'll do that. Okay. Got it. Okay. And then next, um, we're going to talk a little bit about something called the wheel of life. And so, Oh you, yes. You, mm -hmm. I, I know you know about the wheel of life. I use this sometimes with clients, not always, but once in a while when it's the right time. Yeah, definitely. So it's, it's something that I think everybody should do. Um, probably like every couple of years you are, well, you want to do it every month to be honest, but you want to at least look at this every couple of years. And I, for the listeners, what it looks like is um, you draw like a circle and then kind of make it, cut it up into like a pizza pie. And each piece of that pie is going to contain a really important part of your growth. And you think about the circle, the pie as um, like a wheel, right? Like a tire. If one section is missing or not doing well, um, then you're going to be running on a flat tire. You're going to end up having burnout and not be able to make you know, it to where you need to make it. So mm -hmm. some of the sections of the wheel of life are your um, personal growth, like your career, your learning, like how satisfied on a scale of one to 10 are you with that? Um, your wealth and your finance, how satisfied are you with that? Your health, your physical health, your strength, your wellness, your mental health. Um, how same thing, one to 10, your relationships, how are your relationships with your friends and your family? And then your relationship with your partner. Do you have a partner? What does that look like? How satisfied are you with that? Um, your self-love, your self-respect, your spiritual guidance. So what does that look like? And then the difference that you make in the community. And you want to really gauge where you're at one to 10 on each of these things. And if you, you know, are not doing well on one of those areas, then you need to create smart goals. And we'll talk about those in a few minutes around how to address those. So hmm. you should take that wheel of life and now look at your four best areas and make sure that you've covered those. Like on that wheel of life, do you have something in there around like protecting your career, um, growing where you need to go? Do you have something on there around, you know, your finance, your health is, are all these areas covered? And if they're not, you kind of write them and put them to the side. Now, mm -hmm. the next step is you take your to-do list and anything that is on your to-do list that is not going to direct you, get, get you to those themes that you have on that paper, you need to take them off your to-do list. And I know it's- Wow. Okay. I love, I love that. That's really great. And this is part of developing resilience because you have to focus on the things that really matter. Is that kind of what part of this exercise is? Yeah, well, the, the meaning behind it is that this is just a fact of the matter. People seek happiness. Mm-hmm. And they want to get rid of things like anxiety and um, they want to get rid of these negative feelings that we have. But who do you think in the whole world um, does not have anxiety? There's one, there's one subset of population. The Dalai Lama, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. It's dead people. Yeah. Keith, it's dead people. Dead people are the only yeah. people that don't have anxiety. They're the only people. We don't really know that, but I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> So, but I hope so. Dalai Lama, because they're human, they have it, the right. They experience, sure. uh, they experience anger, like they just do. It's part of who we are as a human being. And so we shouldn't want to get rid of um, the anxiety and we shouldn't strive to be happy because happiness is also comes and goes, right? It could be, mm -hmm. you know, those things that you have on your list that, you know, maybe you have a million, that you're a millionaire. 
yeah, you can, once you get the millionaire, you'll have a short amount of time that you have really a ton of happiness, but then little by little, it goes down and you maybe want even more mm-hmm. millions because that, that initial wave of happiness is not designed to stay in our lives. It just isn't. So instead of seeking happiness, we need to be seeking meaning in our life. And by doing this exercise, you begin to discover what your why is and you begin to move into things that create meaning for you versus um, things that create happiness for you, which is really what sets you up for resilience. Because if you think it's happiness, happiness comes and goes, you're not going to be resilient. That would mean that the only time you're resilient is when you're happy. But if you Mm. create meaning, even when really terrible things happen in your life, you still have that meaning and you have something that's going to give you that boost when you feel like you can't do it anymore. Wow. Can I ask a question before we take a break? um, And then we'll come back to this. I wanted to ask when you lead nurse leaders in exercises like this. And I do somewhat similar things with my clients. I do SWOT analyses and things like that. So when when you do this, what are some of the themes you hear? Like, are there overarching themes that you keep hearing over and over again? You're like, okay, so this is this is the crux of the matter with nurse leaders, especially in these times of crisis and difficulty and challenge in the world? The two that I hear um, most Mm -hmm. frequently that come up are family and career. Family. Um, I hear a lot of family, a lot of career. Um, I do hear a lot of um, community um, service as well. And then I hear a lot of personal development. But where are they, where are they most pressed? Is it, is it family? Like during the pandemic, are they pressed because of family because of isolation and things like that. And, you know, where, where are their friction points often? It's, it's um, like 95% of the time it's um, their relationships, whether it be with relationships or with, okay. uh, another person. So um, a lot of folks are, are, they struggle with that. And as a leader, they want to be accessible, you know, all the time to their people, but they don't realize that their family um, is much more valuable, right? I left Kaiser and my job posting was up the next day, but if I had left my family, um, they'd grieve for the rest of their life. And I think that's something that we forget a lot of times as we're climbing that ladder. Ah, I see. And then when we're under great duress, like during the pandemic, then our priorities and the places where we have energy to put get skewed, right? Because the pandemic sucks energy because you can't see your friends, you can't see your grandchild, right? You can't fly to see your parents and you don't have social interaction as much as you might. You might be telecommuting or you might be working in a workplace and then your kids are home and you know they're distressed and their mental health is being being pushed to the edge because they can't go to school and see their friends. So when we come back from the break, we can we can circle back to this. And I'd like to talk more about resiliency and mental health and also and also just this journey you've been on and other lessons you've learned along the way that you might want to share with the audience. So we'll be right back with the second half of episode 317 of The Nurse Keith Show. So now we're going to take a pause for the cause for just a moment. Please consider becoming a patron of The Nurse Keith Show, just like other awesome listeners who value the show so much that they want to give just a little bit each month to support the work we're doing here. When you pledge, you not only get the satisfaction of helping produce and support The Nurse Keith Show, you also get some pretty cool premiums and gifts from yours truly. Just head over to patreon.com forward slash Nurse Keith to read all about it. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com forward slash Nurse Keith. And if you know someone who could benefit from career coaching with me, please consider referring them. And if they become a paying client, you'll receive credit for an hour of coaching with me. And there's no expiration date on that credit. So you can keep it in your back pocket until you need it most. And remember that you can refer as many people as you like and continue to earn those coaching credits. What an incredible deal. And please head over to nursekeith.com and sign up for my newsletter, which comes out regularly and brings you supportive messages, updates from my blog and my podcast, resources, and all sorts of other stuff. 
Remember, nursekeith.com, sign up for that newsletter, and you'll also get a free download from me as my gift to you. Anyway, those are my sincere asks today. So now let's dig back into today's topic without further ado. Welcome back to the second half of the episode. Remember the show notes where you can learn about Chris Racinos and the Nurse Leader Network will be at nursekeith.com forward slash the word episode and the number 317. And now we're back with friend of the pod, Chris Racinos. And Chris, before this, we were you were actually walking me through this process, which I might take some of this and bring the wheel of life back into some of the coaching I do, depending on the person. And we were looking at these different areas where we can discover and ascertain, huh, now that area of my life is pretty flat or that area really needs some work. And oh, this area is actually doing okay. And you were saying how when we made that to-do list of all the stuff we do in our professional lives and at work and then in our personal lives and personal growth and then just the stuff we do every day, that if the things we generally do aren't feeding the increase of fulfillment and meaning in these different parts of our lives, then maybe those things, maybe we're not going to do them anymore. Or maybe we're going to take them way down on the ladder of importance. So walk us through a little bit more of this and and how the listeners can use this to build resilience, whether they're nurse leaders or they're they're staff nurses who are leaders in their own right, um, wherever they happen to be on their trajectory. Absolutely. So I'd like to kind of start with saying, you know, what I get a lot of times when I say check it off your to-do list um, is I can't check this off my to-do list. Uh, For example, emails, like I can't take that off my to-do list. I'm, you know, I, I have to respond to my emails. And what I'll say to that is, there's a different way to do that. So you, mm-hmm. you can, you can have your emails and be, let the notifications be on and be distracted by emails coming in every 10 seconds, or you can empower the people that are sending the emails to not have to send them to you. So are people sending you emails because things aren't clear and you need to get clearer in your meetings? Are they sending them to you because maybe you're micromanaging and you want to see everything that maybe you don't really need to be seeing? Really empower people to not have to send you um, the email so that you don't have emails to check. So there's a lot of different ways and it just depends on why people are sending you the emails. But every single thing on your list, if it is not getting you to where you need to go on those four areas, it's time to let it go. Now, um, before we had break, we talked about, you know, you said, what, what, what's one thing that you see as a common theme? And I said it was family and relationships. Yeah. That's what people yeah. identify. But the biggest thing that I identify that they're missing is their own self-care. Mm. So they'll put on there, I want to be there for my family. I want to, you know, just like I did. I want to be at PTA meetings. I want to have great relationships, all of these things. And they neglect the first person, which is themselves. So is this the typical codependent nurse? <laughs> no, I, I don't know if it's codependent. I think it's a lack of awareness, to be honest. I think because we okay. um, are constantly in give mode, it's really easy to forget that we cannot be the best versions of ourselves if we're not taking care of ourselves first. And so I get a lot of excuses from people like, well, I'm busy or I don't have time. I get it from students. Like I have to study and I just, I don't have time because I'm studying. And what I tell them is, If you don't make time, your body will make you make the time when you get sick, whether that be from a mental Mm -hmm. health illness or from, you know, irritable bowel, whatever can, uh, you know, have it, heart disease, whatever it is. Whatever gets you. Yeah. Yeah. And so if you don't make time for that self-care, you will pay the price later. It's going to come now or it's going to come later. So you don't have a choice. But, you know, I also tell them you're most liable to make a mistake and hurt somebody as a nurse when you haven't given yourself self-care, when you're burning out, when you're stressed out as a leader, as a frontline, as it doesn't matter, even as a parent, um, if you're not taking care of yourself, you're not giving your best version of yourself and you're more likely to hurt somebody else or make a mistake. So if you think that by sacrificing your self-care, you're helping, you're actually not, you're actually um, really uh, doing the complete opposite of that. And that's why it's not selfish to have self-care. So, yeah. And and there is a lot out there about nurse self-care. And I often say when I do presentations and things like that, it's like, there's different types of self-care. You know, people might think of, you know, 
taking a bath and, you know, reading a book and, you know, going for walks. And those are great. And I often say that sometimes we have to go a lot deeper than that um, because some of us need a lot more, um, I'm thinking of the word succor, like we need, we need more, we need more to support us than simply those actions, though those actions add up over time. What, what do you think of that? Like when someone says, oh my gosh, I need to take better care of myself. Where do you go? Where do you lead them? So I, I lead them by, here's, here's what I think a lot of people have um, a misconception about around um, self-care. They think number one, um, that it has to be something really huge, right? So maybe it's like, well, my self-care is I have to lose 20 pounds or I have to exercise every day or, you know, whatever it is, you know, is, you know, for somebody who's not ever exercised to exercise 30 minutes a day, that's a lot. It's, it's a lot. And it's um, really not feasible. What I recommend is really starting to um, set yourself up so that self-care becomes natural. And so an example of the exercise might be, if you know, you want to go, obviously we're in a pandemic, so we're not going to the gym, but let's say you, we, the gyms are open and you know, you want to go to the gym every day. Instead of saying my self-care goal is to go to the gym every day, say my self-care goal is to make sure that my gym clothes and my shoes are at the front of the door every day. Because when you go to have little tiny things like that set up, um, it makes you more likely to, you know, you're going to walk by it and kind of be like, eh, well, it's already set up. Now it's easier to move into. Same thing, Mm -hmm. you know, eating healthy. Like, oh, I'm not going to eat healthy every day. Maybe you just say, I'm going to, um, when I go grocery shopping, I'm going to buy two more bags of spinach or two more bags of whatever vegetable it is. And then you have it there and you can plan it into your meal. So I think in terms of self-care, like the biggest problem is when you try to go all in and um, really, you know, bite off more than you can handle. And then you just feel guilty and feel bad. Oh yeah. Yeah. With that now. And that sounds one, one sec, that sounds like new year's resolutions. (laughs) Like I never make resolutions. I set, sometimes I set goals, um, but I don't do resolutions because they're always too big and they're always too unattainable. It sounds a lot like that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And this is the cultivation of resilience, right? Because if we want to take steps to build resilience and do the things that are going to get us there, what I'm hearing you saying is that this is incremental, it's, it's small, measurable steps that we can accomplish, feel good about, and then maybe even take a bigger step after we feel good about accomplishing the smaller one, right? Like the, the gym clothes and the shoes by the door are sort of like, to use the metaphor, are the door opening for you to go to the gym, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, so those are, those are some steps for like baby steps for some beginning pieces of resilience. But I think what um, a lot of people don't understand is that there's a lot more to, um, for resilience than that. So there was actually some research that was done um, and the, it looked at how people can find meaning. And uh, one of the biggest pillars of being able to find meaning was community. So this study looked at um, Mm. folks that found meaning and their length of life. And they um, looked at everything that you think of that would kill somebody, right? So um, smoking and, you know, all of these different things that, you Mm. know, over obesity. And then we looked at like even the, you know, the, the blue zones where we say, oh, these people live the longest. What they found in all of those areas was that the folks that had community um, were the folks that had the most meaning in their life. They, um, by being supported by others, especially when you're down and out or happy and sad, whatever it is, um, that really helps you to create meaning. And I think it's something that um, we're losing as a society. We are, we are, right. And there are certain societies where community is more, more common. And you do see in certain cultures like Um, Hispanic culture, that you have multi-generational households and people get together in group. I mean, the pandemic is one thing, but in, in Latino culture, where I've spent a lot of time, people, there's just more of a sense of the importance of family and the importance of togetherness and shared experience, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And it goes beyond your family. I mean, it goes way beyond your family. It really Oh yeah. 
community. Yeah. I mean, like how many times have you had like a neighborhood block party, right? Probably never, even though that's something that really sets you up to um, find meaning in your life and to become very resilient. I think when I look back as, as a, at my time as a foster kid, that's what I had. And that's really what helped me get through that. I lived in a group home with 120 other girls and half of them had babies and we were all, 120. we were all, we all were doing all kinds of crazy stuff. There were so many of us. It was a giant group home here in Los Angeles called uh, St. Anne's and, uh, or actually, I'm sorry, it wasn't St. Anne's. My sister stayed at St. Anne's. Um, it was Booth Memorial. And, um, and that was our community. Like we looked out for one another. We had each other's backs through the thick and the thin. We, you know, taught each other parenting hacks. And that really was a huge piece of it that I had no clue. I mean, I'm just like, oh, well, it's a like kind of cool place to have, have a bunch of girlfriends. Right. But it really was a community. And so I think, um, you know, when you're looking at resilience, really, really hone in on who is your community. Most of us can only count like our really close friends on one hand. And that's a problem. Hmm. Um, that's a problem yeah. that, you know, so, so it's important as you, um, look to build your resiliency that you only have so many time, so much time in the day you have, you know, 24 hours in the day, um, you're going to have to give and take on something. So in your career, for example, maybe you aren't working on a project and you don't, you know how it is when you are working on a project. So some of the other stuff takes a back seat. What you want to do as a health, as a nurse or as a human being is make sure that those things that shouldn't ever fluctuate um, don't fluctuate. And so the things that shouldn't fluctuate are those four things on your list. They're your family. They're your relationships. Oh, we're back to the four things that we did before the break. And can I share what mine came out to? Love to hear them. Yeah. So, so one was service and career. So as you know, and that I find a lot of meaning in the, the work I do. Um, and I don't, it's not always work for money. It can be a lot of different types of work, but it's service is sort of the overarching piece. And then one is relationships because I'm very relationship driven, even though I'm not a complete extrovert, I'm kind of an ambivert, but I do have a lot of relationships, um, many through online communities. And I meet people through LinkedIn and Twitter and I've met some of my best friends in the world online. And I have a lot of friends who are, you know, people I've met in other circumstances. So relationships, and I guess you could call that community and put family in there too. Um, a big one is health. I'm almost 60 and health is becoming a bigger issue for me. And I am challenged in some areas there. And then another area that I, I'm honest about that's challenging is kind of financial security. And as I head towards 60, it's definitely on my mind. So those were my four. And so when we go back to those four, those become the foundation of how we, we it's kind of the, the foundation of the house that we're building. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. I see. And so for, okay. I had the same thing with financial. And so, you know, how I told you my big lofty goal is $50,000 a year to the AFSP. Um, I was working as a nurse executive and I was not making $50,000 a month. So, so that was really like, as I looked at everything that I was doing, my question to myself was, is my current role allowing me to go do PTA stuff? And, you know, all of these things that I want to do my children, like have breakfast and dinner every day. The answer was no. Yeah. I looked financially, am I ever going to be able to donate $50,000 a month with this job? The answer was no. Mm -hmm. When I looked at my community, I, I really was interested in entrepreneurship in helping new leaders and helping foster kids. Was I going to be able to do that? Mm, maybe. Mm -hmm. And then the last one was my health. Was that job contributing to my health? I had gained 50 pounds. I was eating like a ton of processed foods because I didn't have time to cook. I, I had zero time to exercise. And I mean, I had a five hour commute, two and a half hours one way, two and a half hours another way. Five hour round trip commute. Yes. Yeah. Chris. It's at Los Angeles. That's how it is in Los Angeles. <laughs> well, you were going five blocks, right? No, actually I was going about 30 miles, but it was you know, Oh, okay. Yeah, but it was so ridiculous. I mean, I by the time I left my kids were asleep, I got home, my kids were asleep. So there it was just didn't make sense. So everything, although I loved that job with everything that I had in me, it just gave me it made me feel mm -hmm. great. It made me, you know, I was just so happy to be with my nurses. It was the complete opposite of my foundation and my why. And so you have to sometimes take those bold moves. Like everybody was like, Are you crazy? You're leaving a chief nurse executive job, like to be an entrepreneur, like what is wrong with you? Are you do you need medication? And it was really no, like I'm very clear on where I want to go. And this is not going to get me to where I want to go. I see. So, so there's, there's a lot here, Chris, and we have to start winding down, unfortunately. Um, but it sounds like there's, there's a lot of work for us to do around making sure that nurses are aware 
of what they actually need to do in order to move forward in these areas. And we can get really caught up in the the nitty gritty of the day, right? The nuts and bolts of the day and the nuts and bolts of our lives. And we lose sight of ourselves. And I think I think part of what you're saying here, if I can, if I can um distill it down is that if we lose sight of ourselves and we lose sight of the things that bring us what you said, meaning versus happiness, right? That if we don't have that and we're not taking steps every day and our to-do lists don't feed into that, that goal, then that's where we get lost. And I've gotten lost like that many times. And I'm having, I'm having some, um, some concerns around that with myself right now. So there's um, there's a process by which you're leading people in that direction. And I'm going to have to have you back to talk about this more because I want to dig deeper into nurse leadership, but I feel like we're setting the stage for people to realize where their priorities need to be, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, that's really the first step. And then the second step is keep reflecting back on that. So I have folks take your little letter that you have and fold it into a little airplane because that is where we want to go on our destination. And I have them take that little airplane and keep it on their desk and you open it every day, take a quick peek at it. Um, And it's kind of fun to reflect that back on. Maybe five years down the line, you look at it and you need to revise it because it's different. It's changed. um, Yeah. And so um, really fun to kind of go through that. That's, that's wonderful. So Chris, um, if people want to connect with you, I know you're at nurse leader network.com, right? Yep. Not leaders, but leader. Yep. So nurse leader network.com. And on Facebook, it's nurse leader network and Instagram. It's nurse underscore leader underscore network and Twitter nurse leaders. And you're also on LinkedIn. So that'll all be in the show notes. And in terms of what you do with people. So if someone contacts you and they want to do these processes with you, is there do they just contact you through the website and then they can set up a call like they they would with me and kind of have a chat and get to know you? Is that, is that kind of where it begins? So they can do that, but my membership site is a little bit different. So it's not dependent on me. I'm not the hero in the story. My nurses that are in the, the, the membership are the heroes in the story. And, um, the the reason that I built it was actually to provide that community. Um, so as nurse see. leaders, we um, really frequently don't have a community to stand behind us the way that we really need to. And so the Nurse Leader Network really provides that community that helps these nurses find meaning. And it really helps them grow their, tra- their trajectory and their careers without sacrificing the things that really are important in life. I see. Um, okay. So they can come on um, LinkedIn and send me a message and we can connect there. Or they can check out the website. You know, um, I have a ton of free material so they can start with some of the free material. And if they have questions that you can send me an email, I'm at chris at nurseleadernetwork.com. That's great. And so there's there's community, which is kind of something I'm planning for my site as well. So you and I are in a similar trajectory, though you're you're focusing more on that leadership track, which is really important. And nurse leaders need a specific type of, type of um, support. And you've been there, you've been a CNO and you've run, you know, multi-million dollar projects and budgets. So you understand the pressures of that. I've been a CNO of a small home health agency, but you've, you've kind of been at that higher level, really digging deep. And so it feels like this is the time, you know, as we're, we're kind of entering, we're almost, well, we're actually in the second year of the pandemic, the beginning of the second year. And, and we need to keep, we need to keep in a way pushing people to keep looking at themselves and evaluating themselves and saying, what do I need? How do I bring meaning? How do I bring some level of balance to my life? And I'm glad you're out there and I'm glad you and I have connected and created this this bridge between what I do and what you do. And you have an awesome podcast. And how many episodes do you have these days? So, Where are well, you? I just hit episode number 23, but I took a huge hiatus because I was, you know, in the middle of a pandemic. <laughs> yeah. Oh, a pandemic. Yeah. So when, when this airs, you'll be probably closer to 30 episodes. So people should check that out. And 
that's it's a very important resource. And Chris, I, I really can't thank you enough. You're you're so wonderful. And you're gonna have to come back this year because we have a lot more to talk about. For sure. But this has been a good start. We've opened the door. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks. It was a blast. Well, there you have it. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Nurse Keith Show and those show notes to check out Chris Racinos and the Nurse Leader Network will be at nursekeith.com forward slash the word episode and the number 317. So remember, you can contact me if you would like to talk about some holistic career coaching. And if you're a leader looking for some very specific types of community and resources and support, Chris at the Nurse Leader Network is somebody you're going to want to connect with. The Nurse Keith Show is a member of the Health Podcast Network, one of the largest and fastest growing networks of healthcare podcasts that are high quality, authoritative, and tackling some of the biggest issues in health and healthcare at this time. Check us out at Health Podcast Network, where you will find Dr. Sanjay Gupta, The Nurse Keith Show, Penn Nursing, the New England Journal of Medicine, and so much more. The Nurse Keith Show is produced by Rob Johnston of 520R Podcasting, and Mark Cappy Spiesen is our stalwart social media ringmaster, and I'm so grateful to Rob and Mark. They really keep the wheels turning in the right direction, believe me. So be well, dig deep, seek resilience, and keep in touch. This is Nurse Keith saying adios till next time from beautiful Santa Fe, New Mexico, and my new friend and friend of the pod, Chris Racinos, bidding you adieu from Los Angeles. Los Angeles, California. Chris, thank you so much. Thanks to everyone for being here, and we'll catch you on the flip side. <laughs>